Next one is an email from Thomas. This pops up frequently while watching your videos. Is YouTube trying to counter my atheist indoctrination? Does it tie in with Kat Kerr's heavenly limb closet? That's funny. That's an old reference that not everybody will get. That's good, though. I like that. Thought you might find it amusing and or useful. Thanks for everything. Yeah, somebody actually, somebody else, they linked this video, this YouTube video. Someone else sent me this too, and I thought it was interesting enough to play. Watch this. If you know of somebody that's blind, they're deaf, they're crippled, they have an incurable condition, or maybe they're missing an arm or a leg or a bodily part, I want you to encourage them. Please encourage them to come to our miracle services. They take place the first Saturday of each month at 6 p.m. This dude is literally claiming that he's capable of regrowing people's limbs. No joke. Look at this woman. I didn't notice this at first. Apparently she has some kind of a device around her midsection here or whatever. Like, I don't know, a brace of some sort and she's talking and then she stands up and runs. Okay. Wow. All right. Let's keep listening. First Saturday of each month at 6 p.m. and then they continue that Sunday morning at 10 a.m. It'll take place right here at Agape Church in Wentzville, Missouri. The address is 140 North Point Prairie in Wentzville, Missouri. And our phone number is 636-327-5632. Kind of daring, putting your phone number and your address down, but okay. Melbond.com. I should look at this website. All that information is on the screen. Or you can go to Melbond.com. The Bible says in Mark 9, 23, Jesus said this, all things are possible to them that believe. Yeah, here's the thing. The last chapter of Mark is fake, or the last half of the last chapter of Mark, I guess. Most Bibles have this in it. It says the earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have verses 9 to 20. These verses, 9 to 20, they're fake. They were added centuries later by monks. They don't belong in the Bible, and for that reason, a lot of Bibles don't even have it anymore. These verses are the ones that basically solidify the idea of faith healing, like this guy is doing here. Exorcisms, snake handling, the idea of eternal condemnation, hellfire, if you don't, if you disobey God or whatever. Speaking in tongues, drinking poison, I mean, the whole nine yards, it's all here. It's all in the fake verses at the end of Mark. And here we have this guy doing a popular charlatan's trick where they do that like this leg lengthening thing where they pull your leg out or they fix your leg or whatever else and they make you think that they're doing it through the divine power of jesus christ honestly grotesque that somebody would pretend to perform a miracle on people like this so incredibly deeply wrong to take advantage of people's deepest fears and, and concerns and pain a lot of people who are watching this are, are likely disabled. I mean, it is probably targeting people who are disabled, trying to get them to go to this church or to donate to this church because he's convincing them that he can heal them. Deeply, deeply wrong. As I study the original language of the Bible, that I find there are well over 100 verses in the New Testament where God clearly tells us that those people that are missing bodily parts, that he wants them to have a recreation. He's literally saying he can regrow amputated limbs. That's what he's saying here. He can regrow amputated limbs. Bodily parts to be recreated. And uh, a good example is in Matthew in chapter 15, where great multitudes followed Jesus. And the Bible clearly says all those, it says all of them that were blind, all that were deaf, those that were crippled, had incurable conditions, the Bible says Jesus healed those. Then he went on to say, and the maimed were made whole, using a totally different word. That word whole in the original language, in the Greek, and that... You see what's happening on screen. If you're just listening and not watching, it, it, it's this video of a woman sitting in a wheelchair, incapable of standing, presumably. He comes over and he's praying over her, I guess, and she stands up out of the wheelchair and walks it out. You cannot tell me he doesn't know exactly what he's doing. This woman was not in a wheelchair before. These people that he's showing on here were not incapable of walking around. They were not disabled. I refuse to believe that he's literally regrowing limbs like that. Perform it 
right in front of my eyes, I'll believe it. Not a second sooner. And until you do perform it right in front of my eyes, I'm going to view what you're doing as absolutely grotesque. That word whole in the original language, in the Greek, in that verse, it's only used for a recreation. And so that word is used well over 100 times in the New Testament. And so the main, those missing bodily parts, that they were recreated. I want you to know, Hebrews 13, 8 is true. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I want you to know also, we're making a fool out of the devil. And yourselves. That bolo tie did it in for me. I'm sorry, man. You, you just, it doesn't work for you. You need to find a different type of tie. Grotesque stuff, man. Grotesque stuff. But you know what? I have to say, I'm glad that Thomas got this video rather than somebody who is emotionally vulnerable and an easy mark for con men like this guy. Hey, this is Owen. If you're comfortable, leave your first name and state at the sound of the tiny truck backing up. Hello, this is your friendly Texas Satanist again, Madison. My question is, do you think it's fair for people to judge religious founders, founders of any sort of organized following like that, for individuals who happen to be against it to judge what they did beforehand? My example for that would be... Well, before you give an example, let me just answer it from how I feel pre-example. I know that one example would be like Shane Vaughn. He's a uh, televangelist, pastor kind of guy, a megachurch leader, who got himself into hot water for basically a life insurance scam that he was running, uh, like defrauding life insurance companies. He went to jail, got his mugshot taken, the whole nine yards. And it was really, really ugly uh, for him. He made a lot of bad mistakes. And I think that speaks to his trustworthiness as a religious leader. People instill a lot of trust in this guy. And the fact that he was running scams, kind of defrauding people beforehand is a little bit questionable. But who am I one to speak? You know, I was an addict at one point and I got myself into all kinds of trouble before when I was, you know, before I got clean and all that stuff. So I don't know. It's kind of hit or miss. I guess it depends on the situation generally. But let's listen to your example. Oh, we see a lot of Christian um, websites, articles making fun of Anton LaVey for having previously been working in the carnival. Okay, yeah, that's a fair point, working in a carnival. Like, I don't, look, I worked at Burger King, and I don't feel like the previous job that I did really affects my job now or my credibility now. Like, the job that you did doesn't really affect your credibility, in my opinion. Your previous behavior may be an indicator for future behavior, though. That's kind of my take on it. Hey, Owen, this is Alex from uh, New York. I have a question for you. So I'm, I like the, love the channel and everything that you do uh, regarding religion and uh, cults. I have a question for you, though. Um, I wanted to get your, uh, really get, more get your thoughts on uh, Eastern uh, philosophies or uh, schools of thought, uh, you know, such as like Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, Taoism, things like that. Um, it's something that I'm interested in. I'd love to hear your take on it. Uh, that's pretty much it. Love the channel. Thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think that a lot of like Eastern religions, Buddhism and all the others like that, they have historically been the root of a lot of New Age wooey stuff. So I, I'm kind of I'm kind of cautious when dealing with religions like that because it's a quick way to lead yourself down like an ugly path that's kind of hard to get out of in for some people also I, i'm not really sure i see the point what is the point some people say they want to be buddhist because it offers a moral structure that they really like but what made you decide that that moral structure or those moral values it espouses were good in the first place you decided that those morals were virtuous, that you liked them, that you want to live your life that way. The religion isn't deciding that those are good for you. You had to have some understanding that those are virtuous before you even walked into it, or you wouldn't have recognized them as such. So what's the point of Buddhism if you already 
understand these morals to be good and virtuous. You can just take the morals and live that way, and you don't have to take all the other stuff that comes with it, all the religious stuff. So I don't really have a problem with anybody being any religion they want, honestly, at all. I really don't. But I don't, I just really don't see the point in being religious. That's all. I have no problem with it. I just don't see the point, personally. Hey, Owen. Uh, I'm Zach, 14, from Georgia, and uh, as an atheist who goes to a Christian school, I want to know what your advice is for helping others to be open-minded to other ideologies. The reason I say this is because the people I go to school with have been there pretty much their whole lives and are taught really biased teachings from their teachers. Yeah, that's a hard situation, uh, dealing with people who are closed-minded and have been their entire lives, and there doesn't seem to be like an exit for them. How do you help them get exposed to other lifestyles, other types of people? How do you help them recognize that there are people out there that are not just like them? And the answer is to talk about it, to come out if you're an atheist. I mean, don't do this if it's too dangerous. Absolutely do not do it if, if you're not safe to do it. But this is how it's done. If you want to open people up to other mindsets to broaden their horizons, you have to come out and tell them, I'm an atheist. You have to tell them, I'm gay. I'm trans, I'm this, I'm that. You need to help them understand that you are a person that's different from them and there's nothing wrong with you and there's nothing wrong with who you are either. Every time somebody comes out of the closet, it makes it that much easier for the next person to come out of the closet. You had an uncle who was hateful and bigoted and he just found out that you're gay and he said to himself, well, you know, I love Jimmy, he's not that bad, and nothing's really different now that I know he's gay. There's really no difference. You just made it that much easier for the next person in the world to be gay. For the next person that your uncle comes across who's gay. Just made it that much easier for them. That's how we broaden people's horizons. That's how we open them to new ideas. Introduce them to them, whether they like that or not. A lot of people won't. But we are who we are, and that's what it is, and we shouldn't have to hide that. Like I said, don't do that if you're not safe to do it. Only do it if you feel comfortable. But a, a big coming out campaign would be spectacularly helpful to an awful lot of people. Dwayne from Mississippi. Owen, oh, what do you think about the Hebrew Israelites? They have some pretty crazy charismatic characters and some pretty crazy theories on everything. Is it a cult? Thank you. Good day. I appreciate the voicemail. Yes, it absolutely is. I've covered them on my channel, but it's been a long, long time. I should probably do an updated video on them. I actually live in New York City now, so I've had the opportunity to go to Times Square a little bit more often than I had before, which was literally never in my life up until recently. And there are, are Hebrew Israelites there who stand on the corner spouting off all manner of nonsense, like real disturbing stuff. I could probably do some kind of a documentary style thing where I go up and talk to them. That could be interesting, right? Uh, talk to them, ask them questions, interview them, uh, get it on camera, put it on my channel. I don't know. Maybe I'll do it. Who knows? Thanks for the uh, voicemail. Next email is from Reagan. First time writer here. I've been watching and mostly listening to your podcast for going on four years now. Wow, long time watcher. I appreciate that. Safe to say I'm a pretty avid listener. Makes me feel less alone in the conservative Midwest, more particularly Iowa. Ooh, Iowa. I know a lot of Nebraskans who are not big fans of Iowa. There's the tribalism coming in, right? Anyways, here's my question. I have a cousin who I've basically grown up with, and she's 19 at the moment. She's a Jehovah's Witness and grew up a witness, whereas I'm not. My dad's side of the family are primarily witnesses. I've been exposed to the religion since I was six, and even then, I don't think I ever saw it as normal. This could be because my mom and her family are Catholic, which made me very agnostic. Anyways, my cousin recently got married to another JW boy, and as far as I know, his family were pushing for them to get married even two months into the relationship. And her family is not happy with the obligation coming from his. Then the rest of the congregation found out, and they, and they too were pushing for them to get married. I was wondering, is this obligation and pressure to get married normal in the religion, or how is dating viewed in the religion? I said this recently, and it got me in a little bit of hot water with some of my Jehovah's Witness viewers. Some, one of them particularly disagreed with my assessment that Jehovah's Witnesses push people to get married as young as possible. In my experience, in my congregation, everybody 
everybody got married at 18 years old. They were pushed into it. Not necessarily by the religion, but the problem is you can't, like, be with anybody unless you're getting married. And being a teenager, that will drive you absolutely insane. You will lose your mind. So naturally, the holiest of the holiest people would go on to be pioneers or evangelists or whatever else. But the majority of the people that I knew got married at 18 years old. I don't think the the religion doesn't mandate that you get married that young, but they do mandate that you not sleep with anybody outside the religion or outside of marriage. So th that leaves only one option get married instantly. You're basically preparing to get married. That's the point of dating in the first place. So if you're dating somebody, it means you intend to marry them. You don't really date multiple people in the Jehovah's Witness religion, in my experience, once again, which is the only experience that I have to go off of. You don't date multiple people. You find somebody, you date them, and then you marry them within a couple of months. So your experience that you're having here, that's the exact experience I had.